everyone. Well, today Martin was supposed to be preaching, and he, but he asked us to walk because he was going to the posh minister's conference and he's on his head. And so I agreed and we switched. And then when it came to preparation and I opened up and read the passage, I thought, thanks very much, mate. <laughs> what am I supposed to say about this? The first bit about Solomon's house and then about the temple and all the decorations and all the intricate designs. I don't know anything about interior design at all. The only reason I go to Ikea is for the meatballs. <laughs> So as I sat down and I scratched my head and read this passage, I thought, what's going on? What am I going to say? However, as I read it over and over, began to pray about it, I saw there's more going on. All scripture is breathed out by God and it's useful for us, even the bits that are difficult or dense or confusing. And what really struck me was that it's all about worship. So I'm going to focus on worship this morning. So to begin, let me tell you a little story. There was an old farmer and at the weekend, one weekend, he decides to go into the big city. And he goes to the big city church. And he comes home and his wife said, how was it? He says, well, it was good, but they did something a bit different. What was that? Well, they sung praise choruses instead of hymns. Yeah. Praise choruses, said the wife, what's that? Well, they're okay, they're sort of like hymns, but, but different. What's different about them? Well, the farmer said, it's like this. If I were to say to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn, well, that would be a hymn. But if I were to say to you, Martha, Martha, oh Martha, oh Martha, the cows are big, the cows are small, the cows are black, the cows are white, the cows, the cows, the cows are in the corner, in the corner, in the corn, that would be a praise chorus. <laughs> and at the exact same, as luck would have it, the exact same Sunday, a young man who went to the village church, and he comes home to his wife, and his wife said, how was it? She says, he said, it was good. It was a bit different, no, they didn't sing praise choruses, they sung something called hymns. Hymns? What are they? Well... If I were to say to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn, that would be a normal praise chorus. But if I were to say to you, O oh Martha, dear Martha, hear thou my crying, kindness thine ear to the words of my mouth, turn thou thy wondrous ear, and by, and it goes on and on and on, it says, well, that would be a hymn. So, now, just a silly story, but we're not just going to focus on song worship. Worship is a lot more than what we sing. It's about every aspect of our life. So let's pray as we dig in. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you this morning, we acknowledge that this passage is your word and you want to speak through it. So meet us, we pray. Give us hearts that are filled with worship and adoration. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing I want us to think about is our priorities. Now when I was in school and it's coming up to exam time, my dad would always say to me, get your priorities right. Get your priorities right. He would say it over and over, buck up, come on, work hard, get your priorities right. That didn't work, so he said to me, he'll give me £50 for every A that I get. And so then that made me work quite hard. My priorities were getting some money for the summer. Looking at the first 12 verses here, we read about the construction of Solomon's house and the various government buildings in which he would rule from. Now, I think this passage says something about Solomon's priorities. The last sentence in chapter 6 says this. He spent seven years building it. Building what? The temple. And then chapter 7 kicks off. It took Solomon 13 years, however, to complete the construction of his palace. 13 years for his own house and 7 for the temple. There might be a, a sense of disappointment here. Let me read some of the selected verses. He built the palace of the forest of Lebanon, 100 cubits long, 50 wide and 30 high, with four rows of cedar columns supporting trimmed cedar beams. He made a colonnade 50 cubits long and 30 wide, he built the throne hall and the hall of justice where he was the judge and covered it with cedar from floor to ceiling. Solomon also made a palace like this for Pharaoh's daughter whom he married. All these structures were made with blocks of high grade stone cut to size and smoothed on their inner and outer faces. And it goes on. It sounds rather opulent, doesn't it? It sounds a majestic palace that he's built. But I think there's cause for concern. The temple was 60 cubits long, yet his palace was 100 cubits long. The temple was 30 cubits wide, yet his palace was 50 cubits wide. Do you see a pattern there? Solomon, it seems he spent more time, more money, and more land on his own house than the house of God. Priorities. How do we spend our money? How do we spend our time? Well, that reveals what our priorities actually are. It reveals what's important to us. If you travel all around Europe, what you'll see is magnificent church buildings in every big town 
You'll see awesome church buildings. Now, I love popping into church buildings, old buildings, to see the architecture, to see all the symbolism, to see uh, these awesome buildings. It's great. But these remind us that this is what people thought was important at one point. Poor people, normal, everyday people would work hard to construct these buildings. They thought they were important. They thought that having church buildings was something that was important. They invested their time, they invested their money, they invested everything into it. Now, I'm not saying we need Gothic church buildings, I'm saying this revealed what they thought was important. Well, when we come to Solomon here, he's made this spectacular temple, but he's also made spectacular palaces as well. Perhaps Solomon's been seduced by the lifestyles of the rich and the famous. Maybe he wants to show off a little bit to all the other kings in the region. Maybe he's creating a sort of image for himself. Could it be that he was more concerned about his own legacy rather than the legacy of God? It's so easy to fall into a trap when it comes to our priorities. It's not an easy thing to keep tabs on, is it? Slowly we can begin to backslide and our hearts can harden. It's a slow and gradual drift and before we know it we can be shipwrecked, we can be nowhere with the Lord. I wonder is there anyone here who feels that drift this morning? You got your priorities straight. More on that a little bit later on. But the next thing I want us to think about is politics. Now, we've got a picture here. James was down at Downing Street telling them all off this week and getting everything sorted out. So, politics, controversial subject. And don't worry, I'm not going to be talking about Brexit. Think about this, though. Although Solomon spent a great deal of time and money and land on his own property, it only gets 12 verses. The rest is all surrounded by talk about the temple. The chapter before is about the temple. Later on it's about the temple. The next chapter is about the temple. It's all about the temple. It only gets 12 short verses. 12 short verses talks about Solomon's temple and these various government buildings that he's built. The temple is of way more importance. It's very significant. And the writer is teaching us that worship is more important than the government. What God says is way more important than what any government might legislate. The temple was supposed to be the centre of Old Testament life, or these Old Testament saints were supposed to be the centre of their life, not the political structures. Worship of God was to be the most important thing, and the temple represented God's very presence with them. Now today many people's hopes are in political systems. The Labour Party, Conservative, Greens, Republican, Democrat, Socialist, Capitalist. People's hopes are in political systems. But if your hope is in a political system, then you're going to be disappointed over and over again. (coughs) However, as Christians, we are called to pray for our leaders, to obey the laws of the land, to pay our taxes, to be good citizens. Imagine what a witness that would be if all Christians were good citizens. We continue to obey the laws. We can continue to obey the rules, so long as we're not told to do anything that's unbiblical. And at that point... We have to trust in Christ and accept the consequences. It does feel like at times that things are getting harder. (coughs) Western governments spending over backwards to accommodate immorality. Schools teaching values we might think are, are wicked. But we need to stand for what's right. We need to stand for God's word. We need to, whatever God says is more important than any government. We need to hold fast to what he says We must obey him. Now, it's so easy to compromise. It's so easy just to go along with everyone else, to go along with the world. C.H. Spurgeon said this a long time ago, but it's still very relevant. I believe that one reason why the church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. I believe that one reason why the church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. Let's take some time to move on to the second half of the passage. This next section describes the decorations of the temple. Solomon's recruited a man called Hiram, who was a very skilled metal worker, and he had to come down, and he was going to make all these great artefacts. Now, we could focus on various things that he's made. We could have focused on the Great Sea, which was a a giant basin that was the size of a swimming pool that the priests would wash in after sacrifices. We could think about the ten movable stands on the four wheels and the various other liturgical objects. But the thing I want us to think about is the two pillars that were created. The two pillars. 
I'm going to read a few verses about this that we skipped over. He cast two bronze pillars, each 18 cubits high and 12 cubits in circumference. He also made two capitals of cast bronze to set on the tops of the pillars. Each capital was five cubits high. A network of interwoven chains adorned the capitals on top of the pillars. Seven for each capital. He made pomegranates in two rows, encircling each network to decorate the capitals on top of the pillars. He did the same for each capital. The capitals on top of the pillars in the portico were in the shape of lilies, four cubits high. On the, cap on the capitals of both pillars above the bowl's shaped part next to the network were 200 pomegranates in rows all around. He erected the pillars at the portico of the temple. The pillar to the south was named Jachin, and the one to the north was Boaz. So he's created these two giant pillars each side of the temple. Absolutely massive. So it would be 27 feet high. So how high is this building, Anderson? Where is Anderson? Sunday school. Sunday school, oh well. Um, so massive, absolutely massive pillars. 18 feet in circumference as well. Huge. As you walk towards the temple, you would see these two pillars. What was the point of them? They weren't anything to do with the structural integrity of the building. They weren't there to support anything. They were there to communicate something. What was it they wanted to communicate? Well, the, it's in their names, Jackin and Boaz. Firstly, Jackin. Jackin means he will establish. He's the one who's established the temple. He's the one who's established the throne. And God is the one who establishes all throughout the Bible. He's the creator. He's the one who's established the earth. He's created you and I. He's the one who's established various covenants. He's the one who establishes relationships with people. And that pillar was there as a reminder that God is the one who establishes. If you're a Christian, then God has established that relationship with you. That means there's no room for pride in the Christian life. You've not added anything to your salvation. It's all a precious gift from God. Jacking, it melts away our pride. God has established. But more than that, it reminds us of the comforting verse from Philippians 1. He who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ. He's established and he will continue. What God has started, he will finish. He won't just leave you to it. God doesn't, you know, you're not saved and you're left to it. He will establish you. He will continue to work in you, moulding and shaping you to be the person that he wants you to be. He loves you and he will continue to work in you to conform you to be the man or woman that he wants you to be. God is the great establisher. And that's what, that's what people would be thinking as they walk towards the temple and they see Jack and they'd be thinking that God is the establisher. But there's also <coughs> Boaz as well. And Boaz means in him there is strength. So as people saw Boaz, they'd be reminded of the many mighty things that God has done in their history. Perhaps they thought back to the Exodus and God delivering them from Egypt and the many miracles that happened. Boaz communicates that we can't operate in our own strength. We can't do it on our own. We need God. How easy it is to just get on with things and go through the motions. Just work hard and, you know, uh, thinking you're doing God's work, but you've not taken any time to sit at his feet and to ask him and to pray. As Christians, it's so easy to go through the motions, to bow our heads, to pray, to say the right things, to look respectable. But that's a, a waste of time. God wants all of us. He wants to change our lives. God wants to empower us and equip us to be kingdom ambassadors. He wants to fill us with his, his spirit so that we can be bold witnesses. Witnesses in the workplace, witnesses uh, in our families, in our neighborhoods. He wants to use us. In him, there is strength. In God, there is power. In God, there is life. Do you want to receive it? Then you have to go to him. Go to him and receive it. He's more than willing. So just think of the disciples. The disciples, after Jesus, went back to be with the Father. For 40 days, they were terrified, defeated, absolutely useless. But 40 days later, on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out and a change occurred. They were no longer weak and fearful, but now they were bold, they were empowered, and they spilled out onto the street and they proclaimed the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And many were saved, thousands were saved. And Boaz is a reminder that God is a God of power. 
As, as a church, we are sort of moving into a, a new season, aren't we? We've got a renewed sense of spiritual vision. We're going to have a, a new building. It's important we remember these two pillars as we move forward. Jackin and Boaz. Jackin, the Lord has established this work here. He's established this church. It's not our little project, our little building project. This is God's church. And Boaz, we need the power of the Lord to be at work in this church. We don't want to operate in our own strength. If we do that, it's an absolute waste of time. We can do nothing on our own. But we need the power of God in this place. We need God to do a mighty work, to continue to work in our hearts and lives as we reach out to those around us. The Lord will establish, and in him there is strength. And that's something we need to remember. Now we're now approaching the end, but there are a couple more thoughts I want to share with you. Today, if we want to meet with God, we don't need to go to a temple, do we? We go to Jesus Christ. That temple was a place of sacrifice. It would have been a bit like a slaughterhouse. It was gruesome. It wouldn't have been very nice. Jesus has come into the world to be that once and for all sacrifice. He was the only one to keep the law perfectly. He was, was perfect in every way. And he died so that we might be forgiven. So that we might be made pure. If we trust in Christ, if we put our trust in Jesus, then his life becomes our life. So that when God looks at us, he sees the perfectness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, because of Jesus, there's no need for a temple. Because we have access to God anywhere we are. Jesus is the great fulfillment to that temple. The sacrifices stopped because the sacrifices were there to point to him in the first place. The priesthood is no more because we don't need a middleman. Jesus has opened up the way to God. So we can all have access to God. We can all come before him without fear. Surely this is cause for worship. This should stir our hearts. And not sort of this passage, he's filled with worship and adoration as he describes the temple. It seems a bit tedious for us, but as he reads it, he seems quite excited, doesn't he? All these different things going on about the temple. Well, we are called to extravagant worship. God doesn't want your dregs. He doesn't want your leftovers. He wants everything. He wants all of you. Where are your priorities? I wonder, parents, if we were to ask your kids what your priorities are, what might they say? That's a scary thought, isn't it? That's something I've been thinking about. What, what are our priorities? What's most important to you? Are we willing to submit everything to God? Maybe you need to review how you're spending your money. Does it glorify God, your purchases? <coughs> Maybe the relationship you're in that you know you shouldn't be. Are you working too much and neglecting your family and neglecting your relationship with God? Maybe you've been coming to this church for years and years and years and you've never become a member, you've never got involved. Maybe it's time you do that. Or maybe you've become a Christian but you've not yet been baptised. Maybe it's time to take that step in obedience. God doesn't want our leftovers. He doesn't want our loose change. He wants all that you are. <laughs>